my name, uh, as those of you doing the course know, is uh, Tom Bromley. <coughs> Excuse me. I am the head of learning here at Reedsy, uh, and I'm also the tutor of the Heterosh Novel course, which I've written. So very, very nice to see you. Uh, our current cohorts doing the course uh, are on weeks five, uh, looking at description, and week uh, 11, looking at writing. Uh, and then we are joined this evening uh, by various people who are thinking about doing the novel course as well. So if you're joining from further afield, not doing the course, a very warm welcome to you. Lovely to have you with us and hope you can get a flavour of what the course is like. Um, and when the main session is finished, I will I will give you, if you're happy to hang on for five minutes, a very short presentation uh, about what the course uh, is, is like. Uh, but anyway, I can see lots of people coming up in, in the chat here. Um, so as we go through, if you've got any questions, do post those uh, in, in the chat and I will feed those into uh, the uh, discussion. Um, that's probably enough kind of introductions uh, for me for now. Um, one of the things that we do with these live masterclasses on Monday evening uh, is we have uh, guest uh, authors along. Uh, and this evening, I'm delighted to have Ashley Tate, uh, who is the author of this wonderful book. This is this isn't quite the finished book. This is a proof um, of 27 minutes, which is a, it's a brilliant thriller, uh, which is being published at the beginning of next year. Um, Ashley. Good evening. Hi. Very nice to have you with us. Um, I'm just going to embarrass you just to start with by reading some of the quotes uh, <laughs> about the book you, you've had. Um, this is this is the, the press release and you can see here there's a whole page of amazing uh, reviews from, from different authors who've read it. So I'll just give you a, a couple that I think sort of capture what the book is about. So Chris Whitaker, uh, the Sunday Times bestselling author of We Begin at the End, uh, describes the book as a twisting, beautiful, deeply affecting mystery from the commanding new talent. 27 minutes is by turns evocative and unpredictable, truly gripping and deeply satisfying. I loved it. Um, and I love this quote here from Jenny Honda, who says, I, I tore through 27 minutes like a woman possessed. Equal parts haunting and propulsive, this fast moving thriller grabs hold of you and doesn't let go until the final page. The entire reading experience feels like walking on thin ice, like you're waiting for something to crack. And when it does, it's entirely as satisfying as you'd hoped. Wow, what amazing quotes. Um, Ashley, do you want to tell us just a little bit about what this what this amazing novel is, is about? Sure, thank you. Um, it's a novel about, it's a thriller about grief and what happens when the secrets in a small town become impossible to stay buried. Um, do you want me to talk a little bit more? That's yeah, my different. very quick one-liner. Okay. <laughs> so it takes place in fictional West Wilmer, a small claustrophobic town that's never really been able to move on from the car accident that killed the town's golden girl, Phoebe Dean, 10 years ago. So it opens 10 years after that fact in the days leading up to a memorial that's being held in her honor. And the four people, it's told in alternating perspectives of the four people that were most impacted by the night. Grant and Becca, who are in the car, and then June, whose troubled brother Wyatt left that same night but is suddenly back. And over the days leading up to the memorial, the characters start to unravel. The closer we get to the truth of what really happened and why it took Grant 27 minutes to call for help when, it, had he called earlier, his sister might still be alive. Wow. And it's, it's one of those books where it's quite difficult to, to go into too much detail without giving away the, the plots. So I, I will do my best not to not to spoil it for everyone who, who, who might read the book. But as you're describing there, and I'm going to talk about some of the different elements uh, involved in the in, in the in the writing and the construction of the book. But obviously, there's, there's a lot going on here in terms of the story, in terms of the timelines, in terms of the characters. Um, so what was the the, the starting point did you have this whole vision to begin with or, or was the beginning something a lot smaller well um i struggle with ideas and so um i have a couple and they kind of live with me and this idea came to me 10 years ago i watched a movie that really um kind of blew me away i'm not going to say what it was because i don't want to give it away and then so i had this kind of twist sitting here and then what gave me kind of the inspiration to actually start writing it was that my mother did die and kind of a she had pancreatic cancer it was it was quick and awful and I needed to channel that um it was a very cathartic experience for me but it was really kind of this mix of this twist that had 
wouldn't leave me alone and needing an outlet for um, grieving. And this book to me is very much about grief. Um, so yeah, those were the two kind of, the, the, that's what I needed to start. And, and was it was it the fusion or the combination of the two that was the, the, the spark that made it come to life? I, I think so. Um, you know, writing a book is really daunting and I needed those two elements to come together for me to want to sit down and really explore these feelings of grief. And, you know, it's it's a kind of a dark story, um, but that was the place I was in at the time. And I, it's not the first book I've ever written, but I am, I, I love that it's kind of my debut because it, it really means a lot to me, this book. I, th I, th I think that element of grief is, 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 is really interesting for, for, for a couple of reasons. I think, uh, so last week we had um, Lynn McEwen, who's a Scottish crime writer along, and before she started writing, she described how she was a, she was a photojournalist and she quite often would do the, the stories where, I don't know, someone had been murdered or, or, or someone had lost their lives and she would go and interview the, 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 the parents of the, of, the, of the child or the relatives. And, and for her, I think going through that experience of talking to these people and going through these situations then kind of fed directly into the writing. And it sounds like you've had a, a sort of similar experience here. I mean, one of the things I thought from reading through, um, the the descriptions of, of grief are kind of beautifully written and, and they felt like someone writing from yeah. experience. Yeah, and, and, and thank you for saying that because that's really what I want people to take away from this story. Um, it is very personal to me. I found grief terrifying going through it changes you. Uh, I don't think I'm the same. I mean, I was lucky. I was in my late thirties when my mom died, but it still really shook me and it, it's really scary. And I don't think that we talk about it a, a lot. Um, so one of the most incredible parts of this in, incredible experience is having readers kind of get in touch with me saying, you know, my mom just died or my dad died 10 years ago. And the story really resonated with me, so that's it's that's been incredible. What one of, one of the sessions we do on the course is we focus on um, the topic of, of emotion and how important it is to kind of bring emotion uh, into the writing. And I, I guess what you're talking about here is you 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 are doing exactly that. You're you're drawing on experience and feelings and kind of capturing those on the page. I mean, there's a, there's a phrase a couple of times where you talk about one of the characters talks about grief being complicated, almost being like um, yeah. a, a disease. I think it sort of comes up a couple of times in the, the text. And I think, I think you're right. It's not, it's not a subject that we talk about uh, enough. So just, so just for reference, so my, my, my partner's mother died a couple of months ago, also from cancer. Um, and it's, yeah, until it happens, you don't really talk about it. And then it's, it's a lot to work through and, and process, and it's not a quick uh, fix. And it's, it's, it's interesting, actually, that something like fiction doesn't touch on it, you know, as, as much as it could or pro probably should, I suppose. Well, I agree, because unfortunately, it's pretty universal. I mean, it doesn't have to be losing someone, but grief happens in so many ways, you know, a dream shattering or a friendship ending or a marriage ending. These are all things to grieve. And if you don't talk about it, you, you don't know what to do. So as a universal experience, I do think that we should talk about it more. It's not something to get over. I remember that was something that I kind of learned. It's not, you don't, get over it. You kind of just learn to live with it. And, and, and when you wrote it, were you just writing raw to start with? Was that quite early on or, or did you sort of process it and then feed it into the writing and the characters? The, I wrote, I started it very shortly after my mom died. It was a very, we had just moved. There was a lot going on in my life. I was stuck with the project I was working on and my, um, I don't know what you guys call them, but my critique partner, my beta reader, I just have one. She said, this is such a time of change for you. 
try do something new, do something that you really feel inspired to do. So I kind of shelved the thing that I'd been struggling with and really kind of poured myself into this story. And um, I, I'm just, I'm, I feel really grateful to, that I had, that I like to write, that I had this outlet um, for a time that was really hard. It was a very hard time. And, and, and you, you talk, you talk about um, kind of shelving what you've worked on, on before. I mean, I, you know, from my own writing, you know, I've got a, I've got a bottom jaw full of manuscripts that are unpublished and, and unfinished, and and, and the, the writing here feels incredibly accomplished. So I, I wonder how many, you know, how many projects you'd worked on prior to kind of getting this one off the ground. Well, this was this was my second novel, but it's not the novel that got me an agent. I had to shelve this one, and I wrote something new, and I got an agent with that third book. And then that one didn't get bought by publishers. So at that point, I was feeling really discouraged. And but there was this twist that I that I, you know, couldn't leave. Plus, the book had meant so much to me. So what I ended up doing, I just completely rewrote it. And then that is what is being published now. So this is I don't know whether it's my second book or my third book, but and then I've written another one. So. But yeah, I shelved. I shelved a couple. And with those shelving ones, would you go back to those at some point, or are you putting those down to experience the, and kind of doing something new? I the book that I got that I signed with an agent, I would love to see out there one day. Um, but no, there's there's some that I I'm they're good <laughs> to be in the garbage probably. <laughs> Well, 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 come on. I, I want to ask you a little bit about, about finding an agent and stuff. But I wonder whether you'd be happy just to give us a very short reading, just to give everyone a, a, a feel yeah, of the material of the writing, because it's so beautifully written. Oh, thank you so much. Um, okay, so I'm going to just read a couple pages uh, from the prologue. So this is the very beginning. She was too young to die. She was too young and too beautiful and too good to die. And yet none of that mattered because in that moment she was lying awkwardly on her back, starting to convulse, gaping at the dark night sky, dying. The pouring rain mixed with the blood from her body, gathering beside her on the bridge in hurried torrents. Her ribs were broken, snapped like dry tinder, her lungs punctured and emptied of air. Her legs and right arm and the right side of her face crushed beyond recognition. They'd have to use her dental records officially, although unofficially everyone would know it was her, because it was a small town and in a small town, everyone knew everyone else, but they didn't know everything. She was interesting and kind. She demanded truth and trust and loyalty. She would have hated knowing that over time she would become everyone's shadow, forever a lingering presence, never there, but always there, slipping into moments without warning at the dinner table, on a walk by the bridge, when the leaves started to turn. The rain continued to pour but the pain that had been white hot and angry was starting to fade. She knew this was a bad sign. She willed the pain back desperately because it was better than the fear that had taken root in its place, that flooded her perfect young body, that replaced the blood in her veins, pumping outwardly to her four remaining functioning organs, now three, now two. She willed her last thoughts to be profound, a crystallized understanding of the world she was leaving behind or the tragedy of her life ending this way, or what she might have accomplished. She wanted her last thoughts to be worthy of this moment, but she was too cold and too terrified to think straight. Do you want me to keep going? <laughs> no, that's absolutely beautiful. Wow. That's an amazing, it's, it's an amazing kind of arresting uh, start to a novel. And as you say, it's, it's, the, it's the prologue. Um, and I wonder, because I think sometimes with writers, they discuss whether they should, they should have a prologue or go straight into chapter one. Did you know from the start that you wanted to begin the book here? Or was this something that kind of came kind of later on? Right. So I know the, you know, there's the prologue as poison camp. Um, but I always write a prologue. I start, I'm a chronological writer. So that first line is the first line I wrote for the story. I will write a prologue for every book, but I won't always keep them. Sometimes I'll cut it if I think it's not working. But for me, it's how I set the tone for myself and kind of it, what's important for me is 
um, you know, what are, what is the reader reading to find out? And so the way that I do that best for myself is with a prologue. There's, I'm just looking in the chat. There's some lovely responses to the writing. So Sebastian just says, wow. Karen mm -hmm. says, love it. Uh, John okay. says, oh, wow, great start to a novel. Um, Thank you. If you've got any comments or, or questions, do put them in the chat uh, as we're going through. Um, so actually, you, you, you said that you, when you started writing, you started with this particular section. Um, are you are you a, a planner or a, or a pantser? I mean, this is a book that has, you know, two timelines, kind of present day and then kind of flashing back to kind of 10 years earlier. You've got a number of different viewpoint characters. Did you have this all envisaged, envisioned and worked out before you started? Or did you play it by ear and then it kind of pulls together at a later stage in the writing? I, uh, I, I, think, I think it was Emily Henry that I heard on a podcast say that in her wildest dream, she's an outliner. And I... I'm exactly the same way. I wish I could start with an outline. I wish I could write a synopsis, but I, I can't. So I am a pantser. I'm very chaotic pantser, but I will start with the big idea. Uh, usually as a thriller writer, for me, that's the twist. So I'll start with the twist and then I'll know how I want it to end because I think those two go hand in hand. And then um, I spend a lot of time on characterization, but the actual writing is, I kind of just let, let, it, let it flow. And are you, because you've got this told from different viewpoints, are you writing it in sequence or do you tend to kind of get into kind of one particular character and work on their sections for a bit and then switch across to someone else and then sort of interchange them? So I will start with a, pretty short first draft. I'll aim for about 63,000 words. I'm an underwriter. So um, with editing, I add, but with the four characters, I would kind of work from four different documents. So each character would be its own document. And in that way, because I, I, I actually, my, my attention to my memory for detail isn't great. So I would have to see them, you know, in a chronological way. Um, and then once I felt like their arcs were complete is when I would start kind of playing around with the order of who's saying what, when. And, and how did you work out that sequencing? Is that, is that to do with plots? Is, how, how do you decide when to switch from one character to the next? Um, that's, a great, I, that's a great question. I know a lot of people work with beats, which I don't. I, I, I write on, on instinct. I, I don't think that's the best way to do it, but that's what works for me. So it would just really be a lot of how it, the, how it felt. And I would try, you know, with the four characters to make sure that they got enough on like page time. And um, I did, wouldn't want to have two back-to-back -back chapters from the same point of view. So it was a lot like a puzzle. Yeah, it must be quite. And, and are you? Do you have that up on a on a wall? Are you someone with kind of post-it notes or a kind of whiteboard or anything? Or I, I I use a lot of take a lot of notes. And by the once I get kind of to the end of a first draft, I will um, print it out in like eight font and put it on my floor and kind of highlight where something is missing. Um, where, you know, there's been too many Becca chapters. So I need to kind of look at, at the order of like that, but it's chaos mostly. <laughs> uh, there's some good questions here. I'm just going to bring a couple in because we're on these points. So, so Ed, Edward says, pantsers have more fun. They discover the stories, they write it. Um, and, and Mike asks, as a pantser, how do you avoid writing yourself into a corner for the ending? Would you have a general idea of how it should end long before you get there? So although I am a, th a pantser through and through, I do know how I want it to end. Um, and I've never changed my ending. So maybe I'm not a true pantser, but I know the twist and I know the ending. I also kind of know how I want the reader to feel. So, but otherwise it's, your guess is as good as mine when I'm starting out. And, and has that has that been the same process in each of your novels, or has that has that changed a little bit? Um, it it was up until now on my second book because I I'm lucky I'm on a sec two book deal, 
Um, I found that process very different just because I had a deadline for the first time. I wasn't writing. Normally I would kind of write in fits and starts when inspiration would strike, but with a deadline, I didn't have that um, luxury. So that, that one was a bit more out, like I, I did try a bit more of an outline and it, it worked, but I wouldn't say that I loved, I loved it. <laughs> I think, I mean, I, I, I mean, my experience with, with planning and pantsing and talking to different authors is that you sort of find your, your own sweet spot about how much planning you need to write to be comfortable. Because some writers like plenty of security, know where it's going. Other writers like that freedom and they get excited by the writing by giving it that little bit of space as you work through. Um, so I, I think there's never a kind of right or wrong answer about how much you should plan. You need to kind of work out what works for you as, as, as a writer but i suppose if you've got a contract and a deadline that's a slightly different situation because yeah. then there's a time pressure rather than you having the space to explore and develop right um there's a there's a question here about uh so first of all saying should, should a story always be linear i mean i suppose here you've got two timelines um i i did, did, did you did you focus more on one timeline than than the other as you were kind of working through? Yes. Yeah, so um, the, absolutely, I added more of the flashbacks through the editing process with my agent first and then my editors. So those were more coming from outside opinions, but I think it works well. They just they really liked. They thought it worked well. Um, my, I, I, I don't know how, I, I think it would be difficult to write a story without flashbacks or a, a, a backstory, but, but that's yeah, just but with, that's how I write. Yeah, I think so. And I guess, I guess it's, it's, it's the, it's finding the balance between the two of them. Cause I guess the main, or I say that sort of the main action tends to take place or the main pull of the story tends to be in the kind of the present narrative but you need that detail back in the, the past to explain what's going on. And I suppose in this book, the present day narrative is very tightly focused. So it's on over sort of three or four days. So that, that timeline is quite tight. Whereas with the flashback material, you've got a bit more space for that to kind of develop further over time. Um, we talked a little bit about the, the plotting and the planning, but I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about the work you do in terms of developing the, the, the characters. Do you develop backstories for those before before you write do you go into quite a lot of detail do you have notes what kind of information do you feel you need to help those different characters come alive i um i spend a lot of time on characterization before i start writing that can be uh taking notes i i'm sure like a lot of you when i'm walking my dog and my brain is kind of um, empty is when a lot of ideas come to me. So I take a lot of voice notes. I spend a lot of time just thinking about my characters and kind of getting them as fully realized as possible. What, what, what makes them tick, what they want out of the story, out of life, how they got there. Um, I, so yeah, I, I, I really enjoy that part of writing um just the human behavior piece so i will spend maybe months on that and i'm writing at the same time i'll, I'll you know take a stab at um writing a chapter or writing five chapters in the beginning i am a ruthless self editor so i might write 10,000 words and decide no that that's not going to work and i'll cut it um but it's, you know, I, I do spend a lot of time thinking about my characters and how they're going to fit into the story and what I want to say and how I want them to say it for me, I guess. And, and, and when you say you're thinking about kind of what makes them tick and coming at those details, could you give us a couple of examples about what, what, what details help give you that spark for them? Um, I, I think a lot about their, how they grew up and what their parents were like. Um, I, I can't remember what craft book I read, but 
it might have been bird by bird, uh, but she said, if your character wants to keep carrots in their pocket, they keep carrots in their pocket. So things like that, um, if they're nervous, how, how, do you, how do I show that they're nervous? Are they nail biters? So it's, it's almost kind of like the core of who they are and then how am I gonna put that on the page? I don't know if I'm how do you say yeah, no, it, it, it makes absolute sense. And I, and I think quite often those, those, it, it's those little details that are crucial rather than, I don't know, knowing where they went to school or, you know, just, you know, more kind of basic kind of stuff. Um, how, how did you go about writing the characters in different timelines? So you've got characters where they are, you know, 10 years apart age-wise. Did you put some time into thinking about how to make them feel older and, and and younger and show how they, they changed over the years? I, th I think with this story, part of what I'm trying to get across is you can be frozen in this, in your trauma. And so a lot of, a lot of them is the same as how they were as teenagers. They haven't really been able to move on. They haven't really been able to grow. Um, so the only differences that I did, I just drew on my experience being in high school. <laughs> um, but a lot, a lot of, of this to me is they haven't really matured. I mean, life has happened to them in these 10 years, but they've not, they've not been able to move on. Yeah, that's a yeah, that, that that's yeah, that's, a, that's a, it's an interesting point, and I suppose that the events in the in in the story is 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 what's going to help them kind of move on. So what you're showing to the reader is is that particular moment of of, of change and, and and how they shift and and, and grow. Um, this question from Sebastian who asks: Are most of your characters inspired by other people in in your life, or more of yourself? Do you draw on different people? Or are they purely from the imagination? Are they combination that that is such a good question and i would say it's a blend there is a lot of me in some of these characters and then um a couple of the characters are nothing like me at all and they're just fiction so it's it's a great question and yeah, it's a it's a it's a blend for me. So there's a lot of me in the story, but a lot is is just made up. And, and, and did you find some of the characters easier to write than others? Obviously, you're writing different viewpoint characters. Did you find some characters just kind of came more naturally, and others were, were harder work? Or how did you find that balance between them? Yes. So um, the 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 one character, June, who has just lost her mom and is is you know grieving was very easy to write. Um, I drew on personal experiences, my feelings, my emotions. So that was that she was quite easy to write. Now there's another character, Becca, who I find extremely unlikable. <laughs> and I, so she was more difficult because she's not really like me. I didn't draw on much of my own self when I put her on the page uh so that was more challenging and then um the grant and wyatt were probably the funnest and again not there there's a lot of fiction there so it's a it's a nice blend and and this is the most amazing part about writing is you can do whatever you want yes <laughs> and, and and do you do you find with with the other books you've written so the second book are, are those also multiple viewpoints stories is that is that tends to be how you write or is that just specific to the, the narrative of this particular story that it's come out like that um actually the first draft of this was just two povs um and then i rewrote it and added two more the book that i've just finished a draft on is also two and then i have a completely shelved book that was that was just one so i guess it depends on on the story I mean, as you say, there's, there's quite a lot of fun to be have when you've got different characters, and certainly in terms of, I suppose, the information that you're giving the, the reader, um, whether those characters are being completely honest, whether the characters know that they're being honest or, or not. I mean, that, that must be quite fun to 
to write, having that element of kind of unre unreliability uh, mm -hmm. in, in some of the voices. Yeah, I, I, that is the funnest part, kind of. Um, I mean, when I'm reading, I want to be surprised. So that's the funnest part, I think, about writing a thriller, writing, you know, a thriller that has a psychological kind of aspect to it. Um, you really just can do the sky's the limit. And um, so, yeah, it was it was a, it was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Uh, one of the other strengths in the book, and I, and I think this is this is so often true about good, good thrillers or good crime books or kind of psychological thrillers, is that is the importance of place and, and, and setting. Um, and I wondered if you could just tell us a little bit about the, the location where the, where the book is set and and how real or kind of fictionalized those locations are. Sure. Um, I love setting. I think it's my favorite thing to write. I I love treating it as a, as a character. Um, but, and I know some authors want to use places that exist. I don't, I, I want, I don't want, and I don't want my reader to bring any kind of preconceived idea of what the place is. So West Wilmer is very fictional, but I also wanted it to be, feel like it could be anywhere. So it's a, and we had a lot of conversation about this about whether it should be specifically American or specifically Canadian. And I like that we landed on, it can be anywhere in North America. So it's completely a completely fictional small town. However, it was very inspired by a real place or the, you know, the sense of a real place. I grew up in the city, but my mom um, grew up in a, a tiny rural community on a farm on the east coast of Canada. And I spent um, my summers there as a, as a child. And so the this juxtaposition of my city life and these um, rural childhood summers made a huge impact on me. And so I, I draw a lot on that experience um, when I was creating this very small, very claustrophobic town. And I would have thought for writing a, a thriller or, or a crime book or one like this where you've got a you know, you've got a mystery at, at its heart, there's something quite nice about having a small kind of closed community without the rest of the world impinging. Right, and I and I think especially with this story that is about um, you know trauma and and uh, not having a hard time moving past it, I found that a small town kind of adds to that because everyone knows your business. Few, few people leave, so you can't hide. And um, it, 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 you kind of feel like the walls are closing in a little bit. So it adds um, tension, I hope, to the Definitely. story. And, and, and there's a question from Kurt on this, because I, th I think we're focusing on, on part of the book, and Kurt was asking just to um, elaborate on some of the thriller aspects of the novel. Um, so perhaps you might maybe just explain why, why, why the book is called 27 Minutes, which I, I guess kind of encapsulates some okay. of this. Okay, right. So the, it's called 27 Minutes because there was an accident and the driver of the car, Grant, takes 27 minutes to call for help instead of calling for help right at the be right when it happens. And the whole question of this story is why, why, what happened in those 27 minutes that made him hesitate? And so the story kind of unravels, and the the person who died was his sister, and so their relationship um, kind of you you learn about it as the story goes on. And then just how many people were impacted by this tragedy and how it's impacted that their lives 10 years later and what secrets are they all, all like holding? Because they, they all, all have secrets. And, and with, with that, without giving the, the, the story away, in, excuse me, in, in terms of that time and, and that detail of 27 minutes, did you, did you, do some research about this particular length of time? Did you go into, into no. detail? No, no. It was a... <laughs> no, I did, my, my, my book is, didn't have very much research. I think, well, I think it, it varies from book to book how much research you kind of need, need to do really. Uh, yeah. 
it, 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 it does vary. Um, so uh, th 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 there's lots of questions in, in here. Um, uh, but yeah, so I'm going to I'm going to carry on, but I'm going to pick on some of those questions because there's some really interesting ones. So so Duncan is asking uh, during the writing process, do you read other books? Um, do you risk compromising your style? Do you feel reading other stuff as you're writing contagious? Is that a I love this question because no, I don't. If I'm drafting, I, I don't read. I'm scared I'm going to like plagiarize. Um, but I love reading. So when as soon as I finish drafting, and it's different for revisions. I can read when I'm editing. But absolutely no reading during drafting unless it's a different genre. And, and it, you know, a romance or something like that. But um, no. <laughs> Do you find that quite hard? I mean, are you someone who naturally reads quite a lot? I find it very hard because I love to read. And um, I think it's crucial as a, as a writer to read. So, and I, I, I one of the most incredible parts of, of be becoming a published author is I get free books and I get early books. And so it's, yeah, it's very hard not to read. It must, it, it, it must it must be a challenge and, and when you when you started out i mean even thinking back to childhood and things what, what kind of authors influenced you and influenced your writing <clears throat> um so i uh loved agatha christie i loved rl stein i was reading stephen king way too young but always the mysteries the thrillers i that's always been what i've loved I, I'm not as keen to read horror now as I was as a kid. I find it a little bit too scary, but, um, and as a Canadian, we love Margaret Atwood. Um, so they were all huge influences on me. Nancy Drew, you know, all the classics. And, and what was it about these books and these particular genres that, that gripped you? Was it, was it, was it <laughs> stories of the characters or the, the, the writing? Or I, I, I just, I loved being shocked. And, you know, you'd read uh, an Agatha Christie book and you would be so surprised and it would be so amazing. I remember reading um, and then there were none and it just kind of blew my childhood brain that she had created this amazing story. And then to have so many books, to be such a prolific writer. Um, Nancy Drew with the just the mysteries, uncovering the mysteries, a little bit of suspense, trying to figure it out. The best is when I couldn't figure it out. Those were the one, the books that really, that I loved. And, and obviously you talk about this book having a, a, a mystery and, and a twist in it. And is that, is, is that quite hard to write? Um, I mean, is that something you can do by yourself or do you have to kind of show it to, you talk about kind of beta readers earlier on, working out how much information to give the reader to kind of tease them forwards, but not so much that they can work out what yeah. is going to happen. Um, that, that is, is hard. And um, that was one of the biggest things that I worked on with my agent and my editors. So I would say the best way to, um, you know, tease things properly is through many drafts. My inclination is to withhold too much because I know the story and it's hard to imagine how a reader is going to read it. So for me, it was kind of every draft adding a little more, adding a little more, adding a little more. But then also towing the line of not giving away too much, but you don't want it to feel like a bait and switch. So it was just through many revisions and, um, you know, really kind of working with my editors and my agent on those. So it, so it's, it sounds in, in, in your experience, actually, you're, you're erring on the side of caution a little bit too much. You didn't want to give it away. So right. it's more actually g giving the reader a couple more clues. But I think it's I think it's a real challenge. I mean, it's, it's an amazing skill to have, but it's, it's, it's knowing precisely when to drop what particular pieces of information in on the reader. Because once you've given the reader a piece of information, you can't take it back. So right. you have to think so carefully 
there yeah and there is there is one there is one um spot like one sentence in the book that actually does give it away and my editor and I went back and forth so many times about whether or not to leave it in and it is in but it that was a hard one to let go <laughs> but no one has so what, said anything to me about it <laughs> so what, why did you why did you decide to leave that in what was the what was the, the logic of that it was a great hype. it was kind of like a great scene and at this point i think it's quite quite far along and it's almost at this point if someone does figure it out that's okay um because you don't want that one of the things that i we had to work on was you don't want someone to get to the end and, and say what like i didn't see that coming you know, you want to to get to the end and them to say, wow, and then realize, oh, it was there all along. But that took many drafts. So it's not it's not it's not easy skill to do. Um, you've talked a couple of times about the role of your agent and, and, and your editor in, in the in the writing and the drafting. And I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about um, how many how many drafts you went through of this before you started showing it to people and at what point in the process you started sending it out and, and finding an agent <clears throat> well this one was different because this wasn't the book that got me the agent so i had my agent when we started on this and um we had a year because she didn't want to go back so quickly after my first book was not bought so we had a year. So I did five rounds of edits with her before she submitted it to publishers, which wow. was quite a few. <laughs> is, <laughs> is, that, is that, that, that feels, is, is that normal? That, that feels quite a... You know, you know, I've never normal. asked her if, and I think I might, I don't know if we did five rounds because we had the time or because it needed it. But oh, yeah, it was that, a lot. Yeah. I, mean, I know with books like um, I think the first Celeste Ng book, um, everything I everything I never told you. I think she she did five or six rounds of edits on that. And similarly with Gillian Flynn's Gone Girl, again it went through a lot of drafts before it got uh, sent out. So how, how did you find your agent in the first place? Um, I when I started querying I kind of reached for the stars and just researched agents that represent thriller and represent authors that I really admire um but then but and, and then I didn't get signed with an agent until my third book so I got a lot of rejections a lot and, and how was that as a process was the agent encouraging was she what was she saying when I signed with her, oh yeah, the, 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 when I signed, finally signed, it was, it happened very quickly. I was really lucky to have multiple agents interested. So I was so fortunate to get to kind of choose who I wanted to work with, um, which is, you know, absolute dream. So that was, that was, that was great. I mean, it was, it, it, it was hard to decide when to shelve a book. And, and try again um but i think you kind of know when it's time to say okay this isn't right keep but i'm going to keep going with something new and then in my experience the shelved book is now being published so you know it, it the road to publication is different for everybody and and, and that, that agent is she uk based am i right in thinking about well, this? yeah so the agent that I signed with actually left the agency, but um, the agent that I'm currently with was at that agency and has since left to go to another agency. But yes, they were both UK based. So, okay. um, yeah. And, and why did you decide to go for an agent in the, in the UK rather than say in Canada or in, in the States? My, well, I, I kind of cast a wide net. Um, and my, uh, critique partner, um, is a very successful author and she, uh, I queried the agency that she was at. So I ended up okay. signing with, um, uh, Madeline Milburn agency, but I've since moved with my agent to Jane Clo and Nesbitt. That's, that's amazing to have a, you know, a, 
a really successful author as your critique past. Yeah. How did you, how, how did that situation come about? Um, a great, great process. Yeah, so it's Ashley Audrain, um, who is, you know, wrote The Push and The Whispers. Um, and we're both in Toronto, in Canada, which is, the author community is pretty small. Uh, we kind of all know each other, but Ashley and I have been friends for over 10 years. And um, we just kind of started sharing drafts uh, a long time ago. Her career took off a little quicker than mine, but we are still, you know, sharing drafts and um, she's wonder a wonderful support. And just, I, I'm, I'm very lucky that um, Ashley Audrain is my critique partner. <laughs> <laughs> and and when, you, when you say critique part, partner, are you, are you sharing her material as you're going along? Do you, do you share in that way or do you write a whole draft and, and then stop at that point? Um, so I will, st I'll, I'll kind of finish a draft, but it, it, it'll be really messy. And I'll just send it to her and say, is this a story that you would want to read? And then she will usually say yes. And she'll have some good kind of over. She's very good at, you know, big picture. Um, and so she'll give me some feedback and I can tell from her enthusiasm if she's being truthful. Uh, and then I'll probably, you know, I'll work on what she said and I'll send her another couple of drafts. Um, I did that before I queried an agent for sure. Yeah. And, and, and once you'd finished 27 minutes and, and your agent sent it out, just, just tell us a little bit about that process I mean that, I always think that's quite such a scary moment when the agent sends it out and then you're waiting to hear right. if someone's going to pick it up or not right well the first the first time it happened no one picked it up so I had to kind of lick my wounds and then with 27 minutes it was the complete opposite experience um, because I'm Canadian my agent wanted me to have a home publisher so she sent it to um the Canadian publishers first. And I had a offer within 24 hours, which was just wow. blew, blew me away, blew me away. So it was just so exciting. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget that. And then um, it got picked up pretty quickly in the UK. And then a couple of weeks later in the, in the US. So it was a bit of a whirlwind that was really kind of a series of pinch me moments and I kind of still feel like that a little bit. <laughs> That's amazing. And and, and do, you, do you find, is, is it the Canadian publisher who's the primary publisher or does everyone edit it in, in slightly different ways? So again, I, I think I've been pretty lucky because yes, my Canadian editor, it, so that's with Doubleday in Canada. She's the lead and she's incredible. And so she, they will, the three editors work together. They, um, and then my Canadian editor will compile notes so that I only have to work from one document. I've heard that that's not always, always the case. And so I feel really lucky. Um, it's been a, it's been a really supportive group and yeah, it's been a real dream come true. I know it sounds like such a cliche, but it really is. It's amazing. And I know because I think sometimes with authors, they, you, you can find that certainly between the the UK and the, you know, the, 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 the American editions that they're, they're tweaked or re-edited in, in slightly different ways. But here it sounds like there is just the one sort of version, which is the accumulation of those of those notes all together. Yeah, the, the inside is the same. There are three different covers based on the market, but um, the, the document is the same. They did decided to do American spelling. So everything is uh, like language is more American, but it's, it's the same story, which is great. And the same title and just the, the covers are different. So, I mean, so I'm just going to show up. So this, this is the, the um, well, it's, a, it's slightly different to the final kind of UK cover, but it's this beautiful uh, detailed with this, you know, with the, with the, with the time, with the hourglass, and, the, and then the birds, which are kind of significant in the book as well. Um, and, and how do, how do the other cover, covers vary? I, I have, I, I can show you. So they're very different. This is, this is the American one. Oh, wow. Okay. Which, which I find is very, feels very thriller. And then this is the Canadian one. Wow. All quite different. Very, very different. 
do you, do you have a favorite? I do, but I'm, I, I, <laughs> but I'm not going to tell you which one. <laughs> <laughs> and has, has it been picked up in translation yet? Are you? Yeah, it's uh, Hungary and Croatia. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's really, really exciting. And, and just tell us a little bit about the publicity. So it's coming out in uh, sort of end of January, kind of beginning of February. Um, and tell us a little bit about how that works in terms of the marketing and the, and the, and the promotion, the publicity and the, you know, the, the campaign before the launch of a book like this. It's been really um, kind of, it's been so exciting and also really fascinating to see how the different markets handle the uh, kind of marketing. Um, the UK is doing this incredible uh, campaign with um, something new every 27th of the month. They just, they made these, there's a bar in the book called Flows, you know, a local bar where everyone from town goes and everyone knows each other. And they made these, and, and I don't have one with me, but these incredible, I think you call them beer mats that say yeah. Flows. And so they did this amazing thing where they would take, take pictures of it out and about in the UK. And just this kind of on the ground marketing. They went to 27 bookstores and they got their pitch down to 27 seconds and just this, all this 27 stuff, which is amazing. And then in the U S it's, it's a lot of good reads and net galley and um, sending it out to, you know, influencers. And then in Canada um, I was so lucky. They did a pre pre publication media event where they had a cocktail party and I went and met all the buyers for the bookstores and kind of key media. So it's been different in every market, but just so incredible and exciting. And I get to do things like this, which I just love. And I, I'm going to be on some podcasts and, you know, writing is such a, at least for me, I have one writing partner and otherwise it's very isolating. You know, you do it on your own. You sit at your computer, at least for me. And so to be out there now and talking about it and talking about my process and having people ask me questions like that. It's just, I'm just thrilled. I re it's amazing. I would have thought actually, although I'm sure at the time, if you had those previous novels that weren't you know, accepted or, or published, it isn't easy, no. but actually it must make this particular moment where it all comes together. Um, all that sweeter, you've kind of, you, you, you've earned it. Um, but th that's so nice. That's so nice to hear. Yeah. It, no, it, getting to this point, there were so many ups and downs. I um, thought about giving up many times. I mean, writing is not easy um, and there's a lot of rejection. Um, but if you, you know, it, it can happen. It can, it can happen. And you can, you can feel like it's never going to happen. And then it does. And, yeah, if I'd given up, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. And um, Victor's asking, when will the book actually be for sale? I know it's out on the 1st of February in the UK, and I think it's sort of similar sort of dates in the, in the US so and Canada. It, Is that it, right? It's uh, January 23rd in Canada, January 30th in the US, and then February 1st in the UK. And you can, you can pre-order it? Pre-order it. Every, yeah, you can pre-order it everywhere. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to ask uh, got a few questions coming up, so I will try and get in as many as we can before we have to finish up. Um, so Steve asks a uh, quick question about AI. Um, AI seems to be the talk of the writing world. What are your thoughts on AI? And would you or have you ever used it, either I suppose in writing or in terms of research? I, I have never used it, and I don't know enough about it to comment. But no, I've I've never used it, and I know that a lot of writers are really worried about it. Yeah, I think it's it, it, it's it's a definite challenge if you know if it can imitate what people write about. It's yeah, I suppose particularly at the moment where, where it's shorter form writing. If people are writing, I don't know, press releases or or posts that are short, I think it's, it's harder for yeah harder to write a whole novel. I'm, I'm sure, but it's uh, yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how that develops over mm -hmm. time. Um, uh, Karen asks, as, as you develop your characters, do you find that you have to relook at the characters while you were writing? Um, do, you, do you find that some of those characters have, have, have changed the further on you get, get into the book as you get to know them a bit better? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. 
I think because I spend a lot of time kind of on the, the core of the, who they are, that they don't really change through the story. Uh, the things might happen to them or um, the plot might change around them, but not really who they are. Is that, is it, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so I'm just scrolling up here, just looking at some of the other questions here. Um, there's one question about the audience. Does your perception of your intended audience change as your book develops? And I think sort of more generally than that, do you, do you think about your reader? Um, do you have a sort of imagined reader in mind as you write? Are you writing for a particular audience at all, or does that... That is, that, that is an, that's a, another great question. Um, I, I, I think the answer is, is no. I am, well, in terms of, of readership, I know that it's someone who likes a character driven story, which for a lot of thrillers isn't the case. So it's someone who is, is okay with a, a bit more of a slower burn. The, you know, there's a literary element to it. Um, it doesn't fit neatly into a box. So my reader is someone like that, that isn't necessarily looking for, you know, like a super high drive thriller because mine has more literary elements. Yes, that, that makes sense. And there's, there's a question on, this, on a similar kind of theme about setting. Um, so Sebastian's asking, uh, I, like how you how, I like how you implement setting in the story, specifically how the setting isn't just a set piece, it is the story. And that's quite an, I think that's quite an interesting point about how you, with description, that you don't just have to, you don't stop the story to, to, to write the description, but actually you find a way of bringing that into the kind of the, 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 the setting and the, and the story and the narrative and the atmosphere. Right. For me, I, I just feel that um, for me to be immersed in a story, I want to feel like I'm there. And so I really do treat setting as its own character almost. And I, I love that. Um, I write pretty claustrophobic things. I think that it adds, you know, a level of tension to the story. But yeah, setting is kind of always in my mind when I'm writing. And I do spend a lot of time on it. Um, we're going to have to finish up this section in a, in a, um, in a, in a, in a second, but just, just thinking about everyone here, we've got, by the looks of things, almost almost a thousand people on the on the call kind of tuning in, and they said to the end, which is always a, always a good sign. Um, but for all those people out there who are writing books, thinking about writing books, wanting to write books, um, what couple of pieces of advice would you, give them from your experiences? I would say I have two pieces of advice. The first is if you're querying um, and trying to get an agent is to not give up, but also to give yourself permission to um, try something new. If it's not working, give yourself permission to try something new because you never know when you might bring that story back. It's not gone forever. It's just gone for now. And then my second piece of advice is for writers. Um, if you're stuck, I, for, for me, it's not overthinking it and just give it again. It's about giving yourself permission to write a really messy first draft. And I know a lot of people say that, but sometimes that's really hard and I edit as I go. So writing a messy first draft is very challenging, but sometimes you just have to do it. You have to sit in your chair, open your computer and just get that draft done and, and deal with the fire when it's over. <laughs> I think that's such good advice. And actually that's what we try and do on, on the course is encourage people as much as possible. You need that, whether you call it the messy first draft, your, your draft series. I work with one uh, writer who talk, calls it their vomit draft. They just need to kind of get it out onto the, onto the page in the first instance. But until you've got that material there, you haven't got anything to work with. And as tempting as it is to go back and rewrite and rewrite the beginning, you kind of need to kind of push forwards and, and, and get to the end so you can move on to the next stage, I think. Um, right. Absolutely.
Absolutely. Ashley, thank you so much for, for, for spending the time with us this, this evening. It's, it's been absolutely fascinating. Uh, and, and congratulations again, again on the book. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a brilliant book. And it's going to be, um, I'm sure a, a huge success when it's kind of out at, at the start of next year. So if you've if you enjoyed, uh, the talk, um, you can, you can go away. You can pre-order already on, on Amazon or other, other book retailers are available as well. Um, uh, but it's called 27 Seconds by Ashley Tate and it'll be out uh, at the start of the next year. Um, for those who are on the call, I'm going to talk very briefly about the um, the novel writing course, if those of you want to stay on. But obviously, Ashley, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank uh, those of you. Those of you are on the call. Um, thank you so much. This was just wonderful. Thank you. It's been lovely to have you. Have a, have a great evening, Ashley. Thank lovely you. To see you. Cheers. See you soon. Bye. Um, cheers now. Um, so I'm just going to talk very briefly um, a little bit about the course, because there's some of you interested about taking the course. So if you want to stay in for a couple of minutes, I'll do that. Those of you who are already doing the course, I think you probably know what the course is like, so you don't need <laughs> to stay for the next bit. And I will see you again uh, at the same time uh, next week. Uh, but let me just bring this up here, and I'll just talk to you very briefly about what this course uh, is all about. Um, Hopefully you can see this. Um, I'm a very slow computer was that. Okay, so I just want to talk very briefly about the about the role of writing courses and what the the the, the, the writing course, the how to write a novel course at Reedsy, uh, is all uh, about. So I'll tell you just very briefly uh, a little bit about who I am about myself. Um, so I've worked in publishing for almost twenty five years. Uh, I began work as a bookseller and then worked as a copywriter, a kind of editor, editorial director and publisher. Um, and in that capacity, I commissioned and edited over 100 titles. Uh, I'm also an author, so I've written and co-written 12 books of both fiction and non-fiction. Uh, I also have worked for the last decade as a ghostwriter. And I've written 15 books, including prize winners uh, and international top 10 bestsellers. Um, and I teach writing, so that's that's why I'm here tonight. Uh, I've taught novel writing for a decade, uh, and I joined Reedsy as head of learning uh, about uh, this time last year to launch uh, this How to Write a Novel course. Um, so if you're thinking about taking a writing course, I know that there's lots of types of writing courses out there, and I just want to outline um, the different types that are available so you've got a sense about what might work for you and whether the course here at Reedsy might be the one. Uh, for you. Um, and essentially, I, th I think there's, there's three types of uh, courses to consider if, you, if, you, if you're wanting to do a writing course to, to forward your writing. Um, at the top level, um, I suppose it's looking at an academic degree, so taking an MFA uh, in the US or an MA uh, Master of Arts kind of here in the UK. Um, and these are you know, the, the, the gold standard, the, you know, they're, they're year-long courses, years long. You get a lot of teaching. Uh, you're quite often in small groups with tutor support and feedback. Um, the, the best universities, they're, you know, they're great courses. Um, they're not cheap. So I think at a, at a public university, they can come in at around $11,000 in terms of fees and up to 36 at a, at a, at a private university. Um, Possibly you have a, a better chance of getting published uh, if, if you do these courses. Uh, so that, 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 that's one possibility uh, at the top end. And um, right at the other end is what I would call self-paced courses. Um, so these are online courses that are a lot uh, shorter um, and where you work through to your own pace. So rather than being in a group uh, or dealing with advice and getting feedback, um, you are paying for a course like Masterclass, I suppose, is, is the most obvious one. Um, some brilliant teachers on, on Masterclass. Uh, there's, a, there's a great session with Simon Rushley, for example, on writing. But these courses tend to be quite short. Uh, you tend to get about three hours of teaching or so far um, on those courses. Um, but as you see, the difference in price there is uh, enormous. You pay $120, I think, a year uh, if you don't join Masterclass for, um, for, for, for 12 months. Um, in the middle, which is, I suppose is, is where we're at, are what are what I'd describe as kind of online novel courses. So these tend to be uh, commercial rather than academic. Uh, they tend to be industry-led. Um, so as well as Reedsy, there's, there's courses run by places like Curtis Brown, who are one of the leading literary agencies, or the Faber Academy, run by the publisher Faber. Um, and here, rather than the academic side, these courses tend to be focused on the writing itself. Um, they're still taught in groups or cohorts. Um, and I think you get that sort of middle way in terms of the teaching. So you're getting a lot more detailed teaching than on the master classes, but not as much as you get as an MFA. Um, you'll find that the courses are structured rather than being self-paced. And I think that gives you accountability. 
in terms of the writing. Um, and I would say actually on these courses, the hit rate tends to be, in terms of getting published, as good as an MFA. Uh, and the courses, as you can see here, are in a sort of middle way uh, between uh, the two. So the same course, which you which you've just experienced a little bit of this evening, uh, how to write a novel is um, it's a three month course, it's 101 days over 15 the themed weeks, um, and the idea is that you get uh, a, a new video lesson uh, Monday to Friday. These are 10 to 15 minutes in length on a particular writing topic, um, and as well as that, you then get a full taught lesson on whatever that topic is. Uh, each weekend, we have a, an author's panel uh, with discussions with different authors talking about different writing themes. Uh, and what we want to do with our particular course is we want to try and get you to get to that end of that messy first draft by the end of the course. So we're, we're thinking that you want to write around 75,000 words, which is the bottom end of a, um, of a, of a publishable novel. Uh, and to write that, you want to write about 5,000 words a week. So we structured the course uh, to kind of build out uh, of that uh, structure. To give you a sense of the, the themes that we look at, um, there's a sort of advanced week, kind of prep week before you get started writing, and then we look at things like beginnings, uh, we have what we call our secret source week, uh, in the first half it's more sort of writing basics, and we look at character and plot and description and dialogue, and in the second half of the course we focus in more on writing skills and techniques, um, details like doubling up and kind of further kind of plot skills. So you're, you're growing and developing as a writer as you work through the course, but we try to balance it to give you enough time uh, to write uh, as well as to learn at the same time. As I say, we had a, a weekly uh, author panel, so we interviewed uh, kind of nine authors in a, in a whole range of uh, genres, from kind of horror to fantasy to, to, to children's to crime uh, to literary fiction. Um, really, really interesting uh, writers on writing. If you enjoyed Ashley this evening, um, that's the sort of detail that you'll get uh, during the during the course. I think learning from different writers is so important, so crucial. Um, and we have a, a weekly masterclass. So some of these are uh, sort of masterclass sessions where I'll talk about a different writing topic. Some of them are kind of live editing sessions, and some of them, as this evening, we'll have guest authors. And these are just some of the different authors uh, we've had on uh, the course uh, over uh, this particular year. So a whole mix again, different genres there. Um, and again, I think it's so useful to hear writers talking about writing and kind of working through uh, their writing uh, experiences. So how much do these these, these courses cost? Uh, I mentioned it briefly just at the start of this. So an MA or an MFA will cost you somewhere between uh, eleven and thirty-six thousand um, dollars. The self-paced courses like Masterclass you'll get a lot cheaper. Uh, it costs sixty dollars to one hundred twenty dollars, uh, and the online novel courses are sort of in the middle here between a thousand uh, and kind of six thousand courses. And you can see here that actually that the, the prices that you pay for these courses reflect um, the amount of teaching you get. It's actually quite well balanced in between uh, the relationship uh, between the two. So if we focus in on the on the online novel courses, um, just to give you a, a rough example of, of what you get, and these are all good courses by by different people. And if, if you're interested in doing another course, I would do your do your research. Um, so Jericho writers here in the UK have a 12 month course uh, that costs around six thousand uh, dollars. The Faber Academy novel course, which I used to teach, uh, is, a, is a six month course. And that comes at about three and a half thousand dollars. Curtis Brown created their novel course is three months, it's a little bit cheaper. Uh, the novel we do in mind today course, which is cheaper again. And then we've got our Reedsy course here, um, which comes in at 1,250. Um, and just to give you an example of breakdown of how much you're paying for per day, you can see that they're roughly similar, but, they're, but the Reedsy course we hope is, is um, competitive in terms of the pricing and what you're getting. Uh, in terms of your uh, kind of value uh, for money. Um, and if you're still here, if you've, if you've made it through to the uh, the end of this presentation, um, we did a um, promotion for kind of Black Friday uh, last week, and we're just kind of pushing that a little bit further. So if you are interested in taking the course, we are currently offering a further 20% off. Uh, so that's another $250 off the course, which means the total fee for the course uh, is, is $1,000. Uh, if, you, if you pay in one amount, you can also pay in installments, which is which is slightly more, but you still get that discount off. And if you're interested in taking that, do look at the website, and I think we will send you details after the, after the uh, session is finished. But that promo code is, is TATE23, T-A-T-E-23, and that will be valid until the end of the week. 
Um, and as you can see at the bottom, we've got various uh, courses coming up. Uh, so there's one in the new year, just uh, straight after New Year on January the 8th, and then further courses beginning in February uh, and April. Uh, as well. So if you're interested in that, do, um, as I say, do do your re research and look at the different, um, the, the, the different kind of writing classes that are uh, available. Um, but uh, do, um, yeah, hopefully do, do bear us in mind and hopefully what you, you've seen this evening you might find uh, interesting, uh, I would say. Uh, that's the end of my uh, little <laughs> promotional pitch. Um, if you've got any questions, do I'm happy to kind of take them for uh, a few minutes before we finish up. Uh, John's asking, do you give personal critique? Um, so the way the critiquing works on, on this particular course is, is twofold. So we have what's called Feedback Friday. So each week in your cohort, you can uh, share critiques uh, with other people in the group, or we, we pair people up. So you're, you're sort of critiquing someone differently each week. And then every few weeks, I run a, a live session uh, on, on these Monday night sessions, and I will critique four people uh, during each of those sessions. So if you're interested in that, you can put yourself forward, uh, and then I will, I will go into detail on the uh, on the uh, critiquing. Um, lovely comments there from Nico. That's very kind of you. Thank you very much for saying that. Um, if anyone else has got any other questions, do fire them up now, or if you want to get in touch with me afterwards, uh, please do so, and I'm happy to uh, happy to uh, answer. Um, but I thought Ashley was, was great uh, this evening. I, I always like kind of interviewing uh, writers. It's fascinating to hear people's uh, journeys. Um, and uh, yeah, if you're interested in the book, do 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 look out for that as, it, as that goes forwards. Um, and thank you all for 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 listening and for for staying through. I do do appreciate that. I appreciate your time. Um, and the very best of luck uh, to all of you. Uh, whether you're stuck into the novel already, but thinking about doing the writing, I've I've written for you know 20, 30 years myself, and I just think it's the most amazing thing. Um, so if you can find the space to do that, uh, you will get so much uh, out of it. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to finish up here now. Um, but as I say, if you're interested in, in, in doing the course, do do look at the details, and there is that uh, promotional code uh, kind of takes 23. Uh, if you are interested in an additional dis discount on that. Anyway, I'm going to finish up now. Lovely to see you all. Have great uh, afternoons, evenings, mornings, days, wherever you are. And I hope you see you all again very, very soon.